All right, so our um, second to last section in chapter one is um, 1.5, and it's on quadratic equations um, and or functions and how we can transform them. So transformations is something we're going to study a lot. Okay, how you can shift something up, down, left, right, or how you can stretch something left and right or up and down. So the first particular function we're going to practice transformation with is parabolas, quadratics. But everything that I'm about to show you for quadratics is going to be true for every single kind of function we study all year. So if you know how to shift a parabola one unit to the left, then you know how to shift anything one unit to the left, no matter what it is. Okay? So kind of important, some of the stuff we're about to go over. So general form of a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c. Now when you write this, a, b, and c, that symbol that looks kind of like an e, that means elements of, or if you want to say it more simply, is a part of. So a, b, and c are real numbers. The only restriction is on a. a can be anything you want except 0. What would happen if, in this equation, you filled in 0 for a? What would happen if you filled in, filled in 0 for a? Yeah. Yeah, the whole first term would disappear. And now do you have a quadratic anymore? No, now the highest exponent is on the x, which is a 1. Now that's like y equals mx plus b. That's a linear equation. So if you make a 0, you just wipe out your quadratic. So don't make a 0. Okay, but other than that, a, b, and c can be anything that you want, any real numbers. So let's just graph y equals x squared real quick. I think we've graphed it before. It doesn't matter if you graph it on the y1 or y2. I just want you to make sure you know what it looks like. So we get this u shape. It has a minimum value and it goes up forever. Um, and what's the name of that shape? Yeah, Blake? Parabola. Yeah, it's a parabola. So that's the shape we're going to be looking at. Um, today. Okay. So it looks like a parabola. So let's see what happens if we graph y equals x squared and then throwing a negative in there. All right. So this was the first one we did. And now this Remember what it means to evaluate. You take what's inside the parentheses and you plug it into your function. If it's a number, like if it was f of 3, I would plug in 3. If it's f of 5, I plug in 5. If it's f of negative x, I plug in negative x. So let's put in a negative and, and see what happens. I'm going to leave the red one there. and I'm going to put negative x squared. So if you put in a negative in parentheses, what does it look like the red one and the blue one are? They're okay, opposites. Yep, yeah, anyone? Yep. Yeah. Symmetric? Yeah, it's basically like a reflection, right? One is just flipped over the other. And that's basically what I'm saying. Um, well, actually, let me show you this first. So that's that's all that that's saying. Okay. It, there's symmetry over the x-axis. All right. Now, um, let me change something a little bit. Instead of putting the parentheses like that, let's put them just around that. All right. Let's just see what happens if I if I do that. Let me just play with it and see if that changes anything. Right, so there's the one in blue, and there's the one in red. So kind of the same looking picture. 
Let's try one more thing. Let's now do it the way I have on the board. Let's do, let just clear it, it's probably the easiest. Negative x squared. So you might be like, well, why doesn't you just keep moving parentheses around? What's, what's the point? Um, the point is to show you to be careful with parentheses, because watch what happens now. There's one, and there's the other one. So depending on where you put parentheses, it makes a big difference in how the graph looks, especially when negatives are involved. All right? So what I'm trying to show you in this case is that the y-axis is basically a line of symmetry. So the y-axis, we just have a single parabola now. Can't even see the other one because it's right on top of it. And it's a line of symmetry. <clears throat> Depending on where you shift the parabola, um, you can change the line, <clears throat> excuse me, the line of symmetry. Okay, and the low point on that graph is called the vertex. Sometimes the vertex is a low point, um, sometimes it's a high point. It depends, depends on the graph. If you flip the parabola over like we had it in one of the first pictures, um, then it becomes the high point. So in this case, the vertex is a minimum. In the case I have drawn over here, the vertex is a maximum. And I think yesterday we, we learned how to calculate max and min. Did, did you do that on the calculator? Like with the rocket problem, finding the max height? Yeah. So second calc, I don't think we did minimum, but minimum works the same way as maximum. You pick a point to the left of your minimum, pick a point to the right of your minimum, and then if there's only one low value in between the two dotted lines, the guess doesn't matter. So it tells us here that the minimum is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 6. That's scientific notation. So that's the x value. And the y value is 2.6 times 10 to the negative 12. Those numbers are both really close to y. Oh, Rob? Not sure? What, number, what are those numbers really close to? Because if you wrote that as the answer to a minimum on a test, I'd definitely mark it wrong. Even on the calculator, that's what it says it is. Yeah? Are they close to zero? There's zero, right? Point zero zero, two point six times 10 to the negative 12 means you're, you're going out 0.00000000012. It's basically zero. Remember, the calculator, this kind of calculator, doesn't do algebra. It just takes a lot of guesses really fast. That's all that it can do when it's trying to find a minimum. So the answer here should really be zero and zero, but sometimes it does funny things because, again, it's just how the calculator is programmed. All right? But the minimum there is zero, zero. So that's something to be aware of. Sometimes you get those funny numbers. And if you go to the table and you actually put in zero, it does say zero. So when x is zero, y is zero. Like not some number in scientific notation. Okay, so let's graph these three different parabolas and see um, basically the effect of changing a. Let's just see what happens. So I'm going to put uh, the original in y1, and then I'm just going to do one third for now. So one third, that's one way to do it, x squared. Okay, you don't put the one third in parentheses, weird things will happen. It'll do one divided by three x squared, and the x squared is not in the denominator. You don't want that. Okay, so let's see what happens. So there's the original, and coming up is what happens when you put a one-third in front. So what did that do? 
putting a putting a one third in front. How do you describe what you're seeing there? Yeah, the parabola looks wider. And what we're going to do is we're going to think of this vertically. Okay, imagine that that x-axis, that's, that's like the floor. Okay? And you took the two ends of the blue one and you pushed down on it. Right? Pushed down on it, it would kind of squish out. You think of like if you got like Play-Doh or something. You push down on it, it spreads out wider. Right? It gets, gets wider. Same thing here. It basically squished the parabola vertically. And when you squish it, it ends up getting wider. All right, let's try this one. Um, let's just put a two in front. So if, if one third squishes it down, two is gonna stretch it and make it taller. It's gonna be skinnier, All right? So again, pretend like that blue parabola was glued right at the origin and you took the sides of it and you pulled up on it. Well, if you pulled up on it, if you stretched it taller, it would get skinnier. Right? Any questions on that? So we can kind of see what putting a number in front of x squared does. Right? So what's the difference of changing a? Well, if a is bigger than 1, that causes your graph to stretch vertically. If it's a fraction between 0 and 1, it will shrink. Okay, or the graph is shrunk vertically. So we're always going to think of it as doing something vertically for parabolas. So bigger than 1 stretches it, between 0 and 1 compresses it, shrinks it. And that would work exactly the same no matter what function you used. If you graph the square root of x and you graph three square roots of x, if you throw a number in front, the three would cause it to stretch vertically by a factor of three. If you put a one-third in front, that would take your square root function and shrink it by one-third. It would squish it down. So anytime you put a number in front of a function and multiply, it's always a vertical stretch or compression. Okay, but we're just studying parabolas specifically. Okay, uh, we kind of looked at this already, but what was the effect when I put a negative in front? What, what did it cause the graph to do? Yeah, it flips it. Now, when we start getting into other graphs, there's two axes we can flip over. So we want to make sure we're talking about the right axis. So let's graph x squared and negative x squared. Just make sure we know which axis it's flipping over. So there's the original. There's the new one reflected over the x-axis. Right, and the way I, I try to remember that is the number in front, okay, whenever you put something in front, that does something vertically. Okay? So if you do a vertical reflection, vertical means you had something here and you reflected it down there. Vertical reflects up to down. Okay? When you reflect vertically, it's over the x-axis. If you were to reflect horizontally, that's reflecting left to right. Okay. That would be over the y-axis. That's different. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to look at that one today. But definitely reflecting over the x-axis. Now, technically, in this one and this one, there's two things happening. The one-third is going to cause the graph to compress by a factor of you could say by a factor of three, or you could just say it's one-third as tall. And then the negative causes it to flip. In the second one, the two is going to cause a vertical stretch by a factor of two. And then the negative is going to cause it to flip. So when you have a negative with a number, that's two transformations happening at the same time. 
Okay, so let's look at this one. And I want to know if I had a graph of y equals x squared, how I would transform it into the graph of y equals negative 5x squared. All right, so the first thing I want to do is just identify how many transformations am I doing. So we'll start, start with that. Uh, so Natalie, how many transformations would it take to turn x squared into negative 5x squared? Two. Yep, it would take two. Now, if you're wondering, does the order you list them in matter? Um, it will. And later on, I'm going to give you, I have it somewhere, the order to always do transformations in. For now, we don't know all the other ones yet, so we don't have to worry about them. So, we'll just start with the transformation that's closest to the x, and then just kind of work our way away from it. So the 5 is the closest. So we'll start with the 5. Okay. Anyone tell me what the 5 is going to do? Yeah? Yeah, so it's going to be a vertical stretch. So that's the first part you have to say. So vertical stretch by, and then say how much, a factor of 5 in this case. So it's becoming 5 times is tall. Okay, so vertical stretch by a factor of 5. So that's the first step. And Kathleen, what would be my second step, which comes from the negative? Um, reflect it over the x-axis. Yep, and she said both things. Don't just say reflect, but then tell me how. So reflect over x-axis. You could also say flip. That's fine too. So reflect over x axis. And that's it. Any questions on that? So I put in the bottom a little note just to mention the order. I already did that, so order is important. And we'll talk about order later on. Let's try this one. So let's take a look at, and I think, yeah, I have it down here. Let's just graph them, okay? And then maybe from the picture, I think we'll be able to tell um, what's happening. So now we're not multiplying by a number, we're adding a number, we're subtracting. So let's try x squared. And then let's do x squared plus 2. Okay, what did the plus, what does it look like the plus 2 did? Yeah? Just moved the two points up the line. Yeah, it just shifted it up 2. And then the minus 3, well, you could probably guess what direction that would go if plus goes up. Minus would go down. Yep. So let's just write, um, let's answer the question. Okay, so to get y equals x squared plus 2, starting from y equals x squared, you would shift y equals x squared up. To get y equals x squared minus 3 from y equals x squared, you would shift y equals x squared down 3. So vertical shifts pretty much work the way you would expect. Positive is up, negative is down. Okay, that's what I'll put up right now. Right. Vertical shifts are a little different than stretches. Shifting is a rigid motion transformation. Rigid means it just takes what you have and puts it somewhere else. It doesn't distort how the picture looks. So vertical shifts are rigid motion. And 
in general to get y equals x squared plus k. And remember, k could be a negative number. So that, you know, if it was plus negative 3, that would turn it into like a minus 3. But you basically follow these two rules. If you're adding a positive number, you shift up that many units. If k was a negative number, then it really turns into x squared minus k, and you would shift down the absolute value of k units. Notice I didn't say shift down k units, because if k was like negative 5, it wouldn't make sense for you to say shift down negative 5 units. Never shift by a negative amount of units. Down takes care of the fact that it's negative, so down 5, up 5. That's all you would say. So, any questions on vertical shifts? Okay, so just to kind of make a connection between that and um, I keep picking square roots, but you could pick any function. There's a basic square root function. There's a square root function shifted up to. You shift this up to exactly the way you shift the parabola up to. Just add or subtract a number onto the end of the function. Okay. Any um, thoughts what's happening here? We're still adding and subtracting, but now it's, it's inside parentheses. Anyone think they know what's going to happen here? But Justin, you have any guess? So it's gonna it's gonna do something, and it's not gonna be one of the two things we already talked about. It's gonna be something different. Um, is the vertex gonna be on a different point on the x-axis? It, it is gonna move somehow. Yeah. Any thoughts on anyone think they know specifically how it might move? Yeah. Horizontally. Horizontally, yes. It's going to move horizontally. Let's try minus 3 okay, and see what happens. So before I type it, any guess which way you think minus is going to shift it? Robin? Um, to the right. To the right, OK. Well, the other option is to the left. Does anyone think left? Because left, negative numbers go left. All right, well, let's see what happens. So we've got x minus 3. So a lot of people think, well, minus 3, right? Minuses go to the left. But if you graph it, let's see what happens. There's the original. Minus actually shifted it right. So plus would shift left. Okay, so that's a little um, it's a little tricky. It's kind of the opposite of what you might expect. So to get y equals x minus 3 squared from y equals x squared, you would shift y equals x squared um, right 3. And that's the way horizontal transformations are going to work all year. They're always the opposite of what you would expect. All right, and now, same thing again, except to get y equals x plus 2 squared. Starting from y equals x squared. OK, I keep saying starting from y equals x squared. Does everyone know, anyone know what that one is called? It's the most basic parabola you could ever have, y equals x squared, and there's a name for it. That's the parent function. Okay, so the parent function is uh, the most basic function that we always compare everything to. All right, so to get y equals x plus 2 squared from y equals x squared, so shift y equals x squared left 2. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to try to come up with a way to show you how to remember which way is left and right. Um, okay. Again, we're dealing with another rigid motion transformation. And the whole goal here is to look at the number after the minus sign. That's how I try to remember it. Okay, I don't even think about the minus sign. I just look at the number after the minus sign. So if the number after the minus sign, again, I know we're kind of ignoring the minus sign, but I think this helps it make more sense. If the number after the minus sign is positive, it would shift right. Okay, just what comes after the minus sign. If the number that comes after the minus sign is less than zero, you would shift left. So see how that makes sense with the two examples we just did. So if the number after the minus sign is greater than zero, shift right. Okay. Well, there's your minus sign. There's the number after the minus sign. Block the minus sign. That's a positive three. Greater than zero. So shift right three. Let's look at the one below it. If h is less than zero, well, so what's going on here? It says if h is less than 0, but I don't even have a minus sign. Yet. So how could I rewrite x plus 2 so there is a minus sign? Yeah. x minus negative 2. Yeah, if you think of it that way, y equals x minus negative 2. So block the minus sign, and look at the number that comes after it, negative 2. Negative 2 means it's going to go left, left two units. Okay, so that's how I always think of it. Look at the minus sign, block the minus sign, whatever comes after it, that's what you look at. Positive right, negative left. Okay, and there's other ways to think about it, but do whatever works for you. Any questions on that? All right, so let me make this a little bigger. So now that we've talked about shifting left and right and up and down, we can talk about how can you look at that and find the um, vertex. So the vertex is basically where the highest or the lowest point moves to. And that's only affected by two things h and k. So if you know h, which is the number after the minus sign, and you know k, which is just the number at the end of the expression, put a comma between those two, and there's the coordinates of your vertex. Now, out of those two, only one of them affects the line of symmetry. Which way is the line of symmetry in a parabola? Is it left and right or up and down? Yeah. Up and down. It's up and down. So if you took a vertical line and you shifted it up and down, would anything happen? No, if you have a vertical line, it already goes forever up and down, so shifting it up or down doesn't do anything. The only thing that affects a vertical line is shifting left and right. So h is the only value that has anything to do with the line of symmetry. You can change k to whatever you want, it'll never have any effect on the line of symmetry. Just h. Okay, and the reason I put x equals h, we talked very quickly about that. X equals is the equation of a vertical line. Um, the calculator can't draw vertical lines. There's no way to ever get it to say X equals, only Y equals. So the calculator can do horizontal, but it can't do vertical. Okay, so any questions on how to look at an equation and identify the vertex and line of symmetry? Let's try it. So here's an equation. 
I want to know what the vertex is, what the line of symmetry is. Um, let's just start by kind of figuring out what the 2 is going to do. Anybody tell me what the 2 is going to cause the graph to do? Flip and become a negative. Okay, so what would it visually, what would happen? It would move to the left. Left, yep. So it's going to move left 2. And then what about the negative 3? What's that going to do to my graph? Would you answer? It's going to shift it down 3. Down 3. So if you know where the vertex starts for the parent function, which is 0, 0, it's at the origin, and you do the two things we just said, that will tell you where the vertex is going to end up. Okay, just using kind of reasoning through it. So where, where is my vertex going to end up? Well, uh, maybe? Uh, it's kind of the, the line of symmetry is going to be at like. Oh, we'll start with vertex. Um, two, three, or no. Negative two, negative three. Negative two, negative three. Yep. So the vertex is left two, down three. And my line of symmetry, um, how about. Madison, where's my line of symmetry going to be? Or how does it? How does the equation start? Um, negative two. Um, even before the number, we want to put a variable equals. So x equals. Yeah, and why did you do x equals? Why not y equals? Because it's vertical. Exactly, because it's vertical. So x equals, and then negative two. So my line of symmetry is now at negative 2. Alright, so let's look at this one. So I want to list all the transformations, and now the order matters. So I'm going to show you the order that you want to follow. And the reason the order matters is because, well, if you're not sure, pick a number in your head. Multiply it by 5 and add 4, and then try it the other way around. Take the number you just thought of in your head, add 4, and then multiply by 5. Usually, you don't get the same answer, unless you pick a special number that caused that to happen. Okay, so there's kind of an order of operations when you do transformations. And in general, we always start out with the horizontal stuff, and then we do the vertical stuff. So shifting left and right, we didn't really talk about stretching left and right. Eventually, we're going to. That would fit in right there if we were going to talk about stretching left and right. But I'm not going to for today. So deal with your horizontal shift first, if you have it. Then your vertical stretch or shrink. Then your reflection. And then lastly, the vertical shift. Now I put a bracket around steps two and three because technically if you switch the order of those, um, it doesn't really matter, but let's just stick with that order. Okay, I also didn't talk about reflecting over the y-axis. That would also be where the arrow is. I could stick that step in there too. Okay, but again, we're not, we're not doing reflections over the y-axis. Mainly because for a parabola, if you reflect it over the y-axis, it looks the same. It's just a mirror image of itself. So, Okay, so let's try this. So we've got the graph 5x squared plus 4. Um, Natalie, how many transformations am I doing to turn x squared into 5x squared plus 4? Um, two. Two. All right. 
And Kaylee, what's the first transformation that I'm going to deal with? The times five yeah. or the plus four? The times five. The times five. And what is that going to do? A vertical stretch. That's going to be a vertical stretch. Okay, we don't have a horizontal shift. We're not adding or subtracting inside parentheses. So we go right to number two. Vertical stretch by a factor of five. Okay, next thing we look for is a reflection. Well, unless there's a negative in front of the five, there's no reflection in this case. So now we have the plus four. And Emily, what's the um, plus four gonna do? Uh, vertical shift to the left five, or four units. Can you say it one more time? Vertical shift to the left four units. So you said vertical shift, I like that, but then you said vertical, but then you said left. Well, vertical means up and down, right? So vertical shift up four units. So vertical shift up four. Okay, and those, those are the two transformations. Okay, pretty good. Uh, let's look at this one. Okay, does everyone have the steps on the right? Okay, so I'm gonna make this bigger. See. All right, so now it says describe how negative 3 and then in parentheses x minus 1 squared plus 4 is obtained from the graph of y equals x squared. So list the transformations and then also the vertex and line of symmetry. Okay, um, Jarek, how many transformations uh, are happening this time? Okay, can you go ahead and name what, or just kind of tell me what, what you're looking at that tells you there's three? Um, I don't know. Well, there's a vertical shift up. Okay, what number is telling you that? Um, the four. Okay, I agree with you. So we have, we have to deal with that. That's going to be the last thing. And then there's... Um, there's, there's a reflection because the negative. Okay, which negative are you looking at? Um, the one. The one. Um, not that negative. Oh. So there is a reflection, but that has to do with the negative in front of the three. Okay. What is that negative in front of the one telling us? Or basically, what? Yeah. What, what does that tell us? What's going on with that negative one? Yep, so we're going right. Yeah, we get the number after the minus sign, we're shifting right. So that's three transformations right there. Shift up four, shift right one, reflect. We haven't even talked about the three yet. That's a fourth transformation. So there's four, four things happening here. Okay, we'll just list them um, in order. Um, well, Emma, what would be my first transformation to the right? Horizontal shift. Yep. And in this case, it would be. Then it'd be going left. Instead of right. Well, if you look at the number after the minus sign, it's gone. But if you look at the number after the minus sign, yeah. it's a positive one, right? So the number after the minus sign is positive. So that is going to shift right. Yep. So shift right one unit. Now we've worked inside the parentheses, we start working our way out. Next thing we look at is the three. Okay, um, Joe, what's the three going to do? Uh, it's going to be a, a stretch. Yep, which way? Um, like in. Anyone help him out? What kind of stretch is it? Really say in. What direction is it? I agree, it is stretching. Yeah. Isn't it going down? Um, it's shifting. Up and down or shifts. So when we did stretching, what was the word I put in front? Yeah. Vertical. Vertical. Okay. 
Um, I had all the steps somewhere, but it was a vertical. Where did the steps go? Maybe I deleted them. But anyway, vertical stretch. Oh, there they are. So vertical stretch. It could be a shrink too, but in this case, it's a stretch. All right, so vertical stretch by a factor of three. All right, um, what's the next thing I deal with after the vertical stretch? Thing. Yeah, Haley? Um, reflection. Yep. The yep, perfect. We're going to reflect over x axis. Okay. And I think earlier someone already told us what the plus 4 did. That was our vertical shift up 4. So shift up 4. You don't really have to say vertical, because if you say up, I know up is vertical. So, But don't write shift up. Tell me the direction and how much. Any questions on, on that? Okay, so notice how that equation is written. Number in front, parentheses, something squared, and then adding or subtracting a number at the end. That's the way we like to see these kinds of problems written. But the equations might not always be written that way. It might be written like, I think I have an example right here. 3x squared plus 12x minus 18. That doesn't look anything like what we had earlier, like that. Okay, it's not, it's not set up for us to be able to quickly see the shifting, the stretching, okay, all that stuff. So, what we have to do when you're given an equation, like I have in example 8, is we have to change it first so it looks the way it should, and then we can do what we just did in the last problem. Okay, and the process for doing that is completing the square. Okay, so I'm not going to go through and write all the steps. I'm going to go through and do an example. Um, if you want to write down a few notes like what I'm doing from step to step, that might be important if you don't remember how to do it. Okay, but the biggest thing is make sure you keep the equation bounds. Okay, if you do something on one side, be very careful, you do exactly the same thing on the other side. So we're just going to practice completing the square. So, the question here is to describe the transformations. Well, the first step is to get that equation to look more like the other ones. Okay, so the way you do it is you basically start by getting it equal to zero. doesn't matter. You know what? I'll put zero on the other side. I think some people like to see it on the right, but you can put it on the left. It doesn't matter at all. All right. Next thing you want to do is put the constant on the other side. Okay. That's always the first step. So I get it equal to zero, just like I did there, and then put the constant on the other side. Some people just skip to that step right away. Okay. But I'm just trying to show you every step. So 3x squared plus 12x equals 18. Now, the next thing when you're completing the square is the coefficient of x squared always has to be a 1. If it's a 3, that's no good. Okay, It can't be a 3. It's got to be a 1. So what could I factor out of both terms on the left to make the coefficient of x squared a 1? Yeah, factor out of 3. Yep. So factor out of 3. And now leave a little bit of room because now we're going to add something to both sides. So this is the part where you now complete the square. This is the, the magic number that makes this all happen. To figure out what goes right here, it has something to do with that number. Does anybody remember the, the two things you have to do to the 4 to complete the square? No, no guess.
yes on that one? Okay, so two things you have to do. You have to take half of it and square it. So let's do it. Um, when you take half of four, what do you get? Two. two, and then square it. Okay, so in this case, you end up with the same thing you started with, but that doesn't always happen. So you, that might be something you want to write down. Take half of that number and square it. Now, we just added something on the left, so our equation is now unbalanced. We have to rebalance it. What do I want to add on the right? Yeah? Yes, very good. That's the thing that most people make a mistake on. You didn't really add four on the left. You added a four inside parentheses that has a distributive property. So you really just added 12 on the left. So to keep it balanced, add 12 on the right. And now from here, we, we should be pretty good. So now we're going to factor that. x squared plus 4x plus 4. It's going to factor into two things that are the same, like x plus 5, x plus 5, or x plus 7, x plus 7. That's the whole point of completing the square. Did anybody see how x squared plus 4x plus 4 factors? Yeah? Yeah, x plus 2, x plus 2. So I'm just going to write x plus 2 squared. And then put equals 30, and I'll help you finish. Okay, so now we're, we're basically there. Okay, the last, um, last step is just to put the 30 back on the other side and then throw a Y in. So how would I move the 30 back to the other side? Yeah. Subtract it from both sides. Exactly, subtract it. And now you've got an equation that looks pretty much like the other kind. Number in front. Something squared, add or subtract a number at the end, equals y. So now we can see the three transformations in this problem. Okay, let's write them down. Step one, shift left two. I definitely couldn't tell that the way it was written originally. If I go back to the original problem, I have no idea that this had, that this had a shift left two in it. So shift left two. Um, the next thing is the three. Okay, what's that three in front going to do? Yeah, wait. Vertical stretch. Yep, so vertical stretch by a factor of three. And then the last thing I have to deal with is the minus 30, and that's going to shift down 30. So shift down 30. Okay, so we've listed out our transformations. And do they want the vertex or line of symmetry? No? I guess not. Okay, but if you wanted your vertex, that's just h comma k negative 2 comma negative 30. That's your vertex. Okay, a question on that. So in order to list out the transformations, you pretty much need to go through this process of completing the square. The only step that sometimes you don't have to do is right there. If the number in front is a 1, you don't have to factor anything out with parentheses. Okay, you can skip that step. If it's not a 1, then you do. And sometimes this is a nice number that's a, that's a multiple of the number in front. If it is, you get integers. If this was like a 13x, then when we factor 3 out of it, we're going to get a messy fraction, 13 thirds x. That's kind of a messy number to have to take half of and then square. But it can happen. Um, so, as I said, you pretty much have to complete the square to get the steps. 
If all you wanted to do was figure out the vertex and line of symmetry, you don't have to complete the square. I usually just complete the square because I never remember these formulas. But if it's written the way our last problem was, where a is 3, b is 12, and c is negative 18, you can technically use these formulas directly to find the vertex and line of symmetry without completing the square. Okay, again, this only works if that's all they want to know. This doesn't really help you to figure out like a vertical stretch, that part of the transformation. Okay, so um, honestly, most of the time, I don't use those formulas. Okay, and then the last thing we've um, we've already talked a little about this, but the zeros of a function. That's where a graph crosses the x-axis. Now, for a parabola, how many times can it cross the x-axis? We'll start with maybe at most. Yeah? Robin? Sure? Yeah, go ahead, um, Kai. Two. Two? OK, I agree. It could cross at most twice. Is there any number of other number of times it could cross besides two? Emma? Maybe one. Yeah, it could do one. So here's an example of two. Here's an example of one. Just barely coming, touching, and then going back up. How about zero? Could it do zero? Yeah, it could do zero. If your parabola looks something like this. So there's zero. So basically, there's a quick way to figure out how many times it crosses the x-axis. Well, how many zeros the parabola has. So again, a zero is a number for x, such that when you plug it in, you get zero for y. That's called a zero. So quadratics can have zero, one, or two times they cross the x-axis. And I drew an example of each one. So if your equation is written like this, the whole key is to figure out what the value of b squared minus 4ac is. Now, did anybody recognize that from somewhere? b squared minus 4ac? What, where's that from? The inside part of the quadratic. Yeah, it's the part that's inside the square root. Okay, it's the part that's under the square root. If the thing under the square root, square root comes out less than 0, if you think about it in terms of the quadratic formula, that would be like trying to take the square root of a negative. Can't do that. No solution. If it came out to exactly zero, well, think to yourself, what's the square root of zero? Just zero. If it comes out positive, let's say it came out to four, the square root of four has two answers, two and negative two. That's why there's two roots. So if you very quickly just want to know how many roots an equation has, you can use that shortcut. Uh, so that takes care of section 1-5 uh, on quadratics, and tomorrow we'll finish up um, chapter 1. Okay, so homework tonight, um, it's on page 56, and it, again, I'll post this online if you need it. It just kind of jumps around. So it's 1, 2, 7, 8, 10, 11, 16, 18. 21, 22, 28, and then 33, 40, 41, 44, and 60. Okay, so just a reminder, I will be here for extra help uh, tomorrow. Uh, no, Thursday, sorry, Thursday after school. Um, if you need to come by. Okay.